to go ahead and get started, if you all can get comfortable. Our next speaker is Alex Volkov from NVIDIA, and he's going to be talking about doing magic on GPUs. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, yeah, so I'm a, I'm a solutions architect for NVIDIA, and uh, this topic comes up a lot. Uh, scaling your work on GPUs, obviously ORNL is very sophisticated, so they have uh, some of the biggest clusters in the world, and uh, our customer base ranges in their uh, sophistication. So I'm gonna go over some of the uh, kind of high level, I'll start very high level, and then we're gonna dig into the details, and time permitting, I'll do a few simple demos uh, uh, illustrating in practice the concepts. Uh, I also point out uh, some of the features and road, maybe some roadmap items we're trying to uh, improve it, uh, or what we're trying to do and improve performance uh, at NVIDIA. So, kind of high level, you know, you, you have cluster services. When you have a shared data center uh, with computing nodes in it, uh, these are the layers involved. Um, you typically need a, you know, you need all these components. You need to be able to monitor your uh, cluster, monitor the jobs. You need to manage your software on it for your users. You need to let them somehow schedule their jobs. They obviously need to write and read uh, uh, their data, so you need some kind of file system. Um, so this kind of high-level approach when you have a multi-user uh, cluster. Again, this we're starting high-level here. Uh, you have a head node, uh, typically, and then from that you log in or remote into your compute nodes. And this is uh, typically handled by a scheduler. Now underneath it you see these uh, IBCE, so you know, if you have a high performance compute where you have a lot of internode data sharing, so like a lot of applications uh, uh, that were mentioned during Keynote, where they're scaling their jobs and you distribute your job also. Uh, the IBM speaker spoke about this. You have data uh, mo uh, model parallel and data parallel kind of jobs, and various uh, parallelism, parallelisms. You often want to have high performance interconnect. And I'm going to dig into the details of that a bit more uh, with keywords like RDMA and why you want to have that. So as far as just technology wise, just to give you a high level, you know, these are all of these uh, various uh, schedulers. These are traditional HPC kind of schedulers that uh, support and work with uh, GPUs. So Slurm, uh, PBS, uh, Unova Grid Engine, the, you know, IBM's platform computing. Uh, those are some, Moab, Torque, you might have heard of those. So the other one, um, uh, oh yeah, and it's part of that also, we have a product that integrates with those tools called data center GPU management, which lets uh, uh, the admins actively monitor. They have signals saying, okay, this GPU is healthy or not healthy. You can do app locks, pro locks. So those are scripts that will, be, when a job is submitted, it checks the node that it's healthy that you can, should run. Because this often happens actually, if you have uh, this massive job that might take a week to run or whatever, and you before you submit it, one one uh, uh, notice uh, something's wrong with it. Our GPU is, is not healthy. If you didn't check that and you ran the job, and now your calculations on that one node are messed up, all the other nodes are fine, but your overall calculation might be garbage, and you have to rerun this whole thing. So it's a good idea to uh, to have these uh, health checks and uh, uh, active uh, job monitoring. Also, you can have these policy and group configurations. Um, so this can be managed through that. Now, the other uh, popular uh, kind of cloud-oriented, uh, I, I call it, to me, it's just another kind of resource manager and scheduler, Kubernetes. You know, a lot of you might be familiar with it. Uh, the Kubernetes aspect of it is uh, interesting because uh, traditional HPC schedulers are kind of, they're focused on-prem. A very high performance Kubernetes uh, decouples that a little bit. Uh, it's uh, more cloud oriented or mixed, so you can have cloud and hybrid. 
So that's uh, a lot of customers, uh, commercial customers, especially when they want to transition to cloud or they want to have, you know, only a few. They don't need a massive on-prem solution. Uh, they uh, resort to something like Kubernetes because their users can now scale when they need to. They can, they have elasticity. They can scale to cloud. There are a few differences, kind of just understanding high level why you might want to choose. Here it says Kubernetes versus Slurm, but instead of Slurm, you could uh, think of any HPC scheduler. So one is kind of microservices oriented. That's how I think of it, containerized. And HPC traditionally, uh, like Slurm kind of schedulers, were not, I mean, now a lot of them support contain containerizations, but initially they, uh, they didn't really have that ability. Uh, they're more batch job, you spin a job and uh, comes back to you, get results, you're done. Kubernetes is often like if you need to uh, spin up a service and you have some kind of uh, web interface to it maybe. So you could have, uh, you know, like your mobile phone, you might constantly be interacting with a, like a web, web service kind of uh, thing. So AI is very popular because now you have a lot of AI applications all over the world. And a lot of them, you know, you might be interacting through them, you know, however, through your phone, through your car. Uh, and so the fact that they, you, know, you can uh, create services, application services like that is very useful. All right. So I'm going to now dive into a bit more details of the technologies involved. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of go through each one. So something that's kind of important for uh, um, especially um, uh, massive scaling, data scaling, when you have uh, uh, GPUs working together in a distributed cluster, it's uh, GPU direct. And so uh, it's basically a marketing term for uh, RDMA technology, remote direct memory access, uh, between uh, GPUs on different nodes. Um, so I have a little illustration in the next slide that will show you basically what it what it's doing. So let's say, hopefully this illustration works. Okay, without GPU direct, let's say you have two nodes, server one, server two, no GPU direct, you have some uh, GPU, and you wanna move this memory buffer here in this square, you guys can, and you wanna move it to this guy. So without GPU direct RDMA, you're, you're gonna have a bunch of these unnecessary copies. You might have CUDA driver buffer, goes to, if you have InfiniBand or whatever, uh, HCA or NIC adapter, your uh, network interface adapter buffer, if through that it's gonna go through uh, to the second node, then to CUDA uh, driver buffer, then finally to your GPU memory. All right, this is kind of worst case, there could be that this guy's unified, this is, uh, but, Worst case without GPU direct RDMA, and this is kind of what you might have been doing, um, I don't know, eight years ago, maybe, I don't know, when CUDA initially came out and, and uh, we started building these GPU clusters before we uh, enabled GPU direct. Um, so you had to do this five copies. Obviously it wasn't very efficient. People are like, and that's a, that's a huge thing is, uh, uh, they, is uh, you want to eliminate as uh, much of that data movement as possible between, especially between GPUs and CPUs. Because even if you calculate something really fast on a GPU, if your transfer time, you know, it's Amdahl's law, you, you know, your transfer time is your limiting component. So, um, so the point being, if that's your limiting component, you don't want to invest in your GPUs because it makes no sense because you're still you know, limited by that time. You, you didn't save anything. But now with GPU Direct or DMA, basically you, you, uh, you have the shared pin memory and you have these uh, special uh, kernel modules that enable you to go from your uh, uh, InfiniBand directly to, to the other systems, just directly through PC, you know, typically PCIe and uh, if you got an InfiniBand or some kind of RDMA uh, enabled network. It'll be just one copy. It'll basically go through the PCIe bus directly to your GPU memory. So from one, so the, you know, it's big difference. Five copies versus one. So the, just for you guys who are not familiar with our uh, GPU direct RDMA, so you understand what the benefits are. So you're saving, you know, four copies. 
which you can add up and be significant. Um, so the other technology I'm going to mention is, uh, you, you might have heard of, uh, is NVLink, uh, modern servers and Summit, uh, a lot of product lines, IBM, you know, other OEMs, Dell, uh, HP, our own DGX line has uh, this NVLink technology. So NVLink uh, uh, is basically our kind of our own bus because PCIe is not fast enough and it takes a long time for that uh, interconnect to mature and there's you know a whole uh, body that has to standardize on it. Uh, NVLink is our uh, uh, is our bus between our GPUs and also CPUs, the CPUs that choose to support it, like IBM's. And uh, the main benefit is uh, you just uh, you eliminate the PCIe bottlenecks. So if you have a lot of data going through your PCIe bus, then you know you, it's not just GPU data; you have other data that, that can become a bottleneck. Uh, there's also CPU to CPU, typically called QPI or uh, I forgot what it's called now, Skylake, but uh, that uh, uh, you can avoid this transfer too if you have um, uh, uh, two no um, multi-socket servers. So the difference is, you know, PCIe is 16 gigabytes with NVLink you can achieve, depending on your server and uh, NVLink generation, we have NVLink 1 and 2 and a number of different NVLink lanes, you can have up to 300 gigabytes a second uh, transfer. So obviously that's gonna, you know, your jobs can run faster in a node that it has this. Uh, so some server designs, just for you kind of get an idea. You might see something like this with HP or Dell, they have servers of this type, like our DGX where you have eight GPUs on a server, have something like this, so you, you know, you, you still have PCIe, you know, and PCIe switches are special. They're important because they connect to your, uh, you know, your NICs, which could be your InfiniBand or whatever NICs you're using. Um, and this is kind of the summit architecture you might have known, uh, uh, seen, right? You have the two power nodes, power nine, and you have the GPUs interconnected. And in this case, it's actually interesting because they are, they're interconnected directly with uh, the CPU and NVLink. So NVLink is a open standard, I mean, is a NVIDIA standard, but it's open, so anybody can use, uh, I need to change this. This is not confidential, this is fine. <laughs> I'm sorry about this tag here, all right? Um, so again, it just another slide to illustrate the point. So uh, you're avoiding congestion. That, that was the primary motivation with NVLink. And just kind of, all written, this is a benchmark just so you kind of see in numbers the differences that uh, you're achieving, you know, when you have to go through QPI, PCIe, PCI versus NVLink. Uh, and this is a P100, is basically this was NVLink generation one, this is NVLink two. So you see how we've uh, improved our bandwidth now between uh, the GPUs. So another, one more technology is kind of related to uh, NVLink, but uh, this is, uh, you might have heard of uh, like our DGX2, uh, and again, this is a open standard, is uh, NV switch, is uh, let's, uh, it, th this is a, let's all, connects all your GPUs in a system in a more efficient way, and it's using NVLink. I put the uh, specs here, but you can have uh, an aggregate of 900 gigabyte uh, bandwidth here. Uh, and so just to I have a f two slides here, kind of explain to you what is it that you're achieving with this NV switch. You know, if you, let's say you have a broadcast and a ring scatter, when you're distributing data amongst your GPUs, so you, you're gonna go from one GPU and let's say you have seven GPUs, right? So each, I mean, it could be a small uh, clock tick here, but it's still, uh, this is what's happening in the ring reduce, uh, even with NVLink. Uh, now, with NV switch, it's all kind of interconnected like this. So when you're doing a broadcast of your data uh, on a system like a DGX2, there's also a cloud version called HGX2. Uh, it's all happening at the same time. So your broadcast it happens in time zero. You're, you're not, you're this, you don't have to do this ring reduction where it, uh, it has to go through each server first. 
I mean, through each GPU, cycle through the GPUs. Um, so one other thing to mention, this was mentioned before, is uh, our uh, library, Nickel. Here I'm gonna, I think it was mentioned, it's basically our collective communication library. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, we developed this to make it easier so that you know, third parties like Baidu and whoever, IBM, don't have to develop their own uh, library and figure out how to talk to our GPUs in the most efficient way. So this, our Nickel uh, uh, version two is uh, supposed to be topo it's topology aware. I mean, there are uh, tweaks here and there that you have to sometimes make, but it's topology aware. It will use your uh, PCIe and uh, PCIe uh, and uh, NVLink in the most efficient way with, when it's within a system. And between systems, it's also multi-node aware. Uh, you can use it uh, over your uh, sockets, you know, your normal TCP IP. You can use it over InfiniBand verbs. Uh, and it's, it will also work with your, uh, with RDMA networks. Uh, some of the just latest features for those of you who are interested in nickel, uh, we added a uh, tree reduction to it. So something you might want to take a look at. Um, and here I have a few slides here explaining this idea. Um, so basically, so right now our nickel uh, library is a uh, collective communication, so it does this all, all communication. Uh, so in, in, this, in this case, when you have, especially in uh, deep learning, and uh, or uh, all reduce, you know, when you have to basically uh, sum everything up or maybe multiply everything up, you have some kind of operation, but it needs to be done on, uh, and to do a reduce on that. Uh, we have uh, our latest nickel supports this uh, rings, and I, I think it was motivated by Summit because it was more efficient to do uh, uh, trees on Summit versus rings reduction. So you can see the improvements that happened. You know, so you scale your GPUs, uh, your latency is much better. You know, 200 uh, microseconds versus this linear uh, scaling that was happening before with uh, rings and uh, your bandwidth is also improved. So, so some just uh, future things to point out. Uh, we're working with Nickel. Our developers are working, uh, they're, you know, it's, it's called collective communications. I don't, know, I don't know if they'll change the name, but you know, we're, they're adding point-to-point -point communication uh, uh, to it as well. That's on the roadmap, uh, so you will have uh, not just uh, all reduce, but we'll have uh, send, receive, scatter together. A lot of the primitives that you uh, people might want to work with uh, that people traditionally uh, would like to use in a distributed environment. And uh, yeah, so if you guys are familiar here with uh, Mellanox's uh, kind of product lines, they have something called Sharp. This was an interesting slide. Um, again, this is uh, this is, uh, right. It's not something that we currently have, but uh, something that is maybe uh, in, uh, could be a, an improvement is um, you can do this in network processing. So let's say you could do some of the summations in the, in the switches itself. Uh, uh, so Mellanox calls this technology Sharp, which stands for scalable hierarchical aggregation and re reduction protocol. So that's an uh, interesting idea that if you can combine nickel uh, with this, with sharp, we could further improve, uh, have significant improvements this uh, bandwidth, uh, on our bandwidth um, in a distributed environment. So you have, those of you who are interested can refer to some of these blogs here. Um, so in so, yeah, in nickel summary. So our latest version of nickel supports tens of thousands of GPUs. We support pretty much all the OEMs. Uh, uh, it's a very popular uh, library that is also used in, uh, you know, if you have used any of the deep learning libraries, uh, most of them support this now as well. So next. 
Yeah, this is some of these slides, you know, talking about these technologies. I'm going a little bit out of order here because it's kind of hard to go in any order because, you know, I, I said GPU direct RDMA. Well, you have to be kind of familiar with RDMA first. So I wasn't sure exactly what order to go in, but if we just back up a bit, let's and go over what is an RDMA enabled network, why you, why you want it, uh, the benefits of it. So you can see that uh, with RDMA, you basically, you bypass uh, the kernel and effectively what you're doing is uh, you're, uh, you're improving your latency. You can also improve your bandwidth and you don't have to involve uh, your typical uh, uh, network layers in this process. So, and so as we talk about, okay, what is a typical, I mean, you have uh, various switches and uh, uh, like I, I mentioned, you know, you got uh, networks, you got, you might have heard something of iWarp and Omnipath, which is Intel's uh, network, popular network, and Cray has their, uh, their thing. Um, but the idea is typically it's, uh, it's interconnected in this type of fashion. And uh, the point is, that you know this, we, there's a few benchmarks you can find, uh, and when you come compared with and without our DMA, again you can see your latency improvements and your bandwidth improvements. So they can be significant. Which, again, is just a few more slides with these charts for you. Uh, you can see the improvements. Uh, first of all, the NVLink. So the NVLink is within a node. Uh, it's, this is for eight, when you have eight uh, V100s. And again, you know, depending on how your um, uh, framework or your code application is written, you know, might, might or might not benefit. It just depends on uh, how you're utilizing the NVLink and, uh, you know, that might, your, dis, your uh, multi-GPU job might not be that much multi-GPU dependent. But if it is, you know, you can have up to, let's say in lamps, uh, 2x improvement. And our DMA, again, you know, it just depends uh, I, where, your, where your bottlenecks are. But you can have up to 2.5x, let's say, in this, in a, this uh, mill C uh, benchmark which is, or uh, application. Yeah. So, so I, I wasn't sure exactly where to put this slide. It might seem a little bit out of context. Just wanted to mention UCX because uh, we have uh, also uh, a lot of work in ORNL collaboration on it, I believe, as well. Uh, with UCX, it's Unified Communication Framework. Um, and so, yeah, that actually, there's a lot of benefits to it. It's kind of, maybe it has, you need its own presentation on the topic. But with UCX, uh, it uh, abstracts uh, some of the, Libraries like I, you know, I'm saying you got GP direct RDMA and this and that. So without having to code each individual component, you know, you have this unified framework uh, to handle that for you. And it, and it already had GPU kind of built into it from the outset. You know, a lot of technologies like you have new things appear, and then you kind of uh, build on top of what you had before. But you know, then so somebody comes and says, okay, we're going to just write another framework which unifies it all. Uh, and that handles our new use cases and new technologies. So, it's, so an interesting thing. I don't. I don't have the presentation here or slides on it, but uh, we're working right now. There's a few uh, pull requests. Uh, if you work with Python a lot and distributed Python in particular, using Dask, uh, there's a pull request where we're uh, adding uh, Python bindings to UCX so that you can uh, do Python distributed. Uh, taking advantage of, uh, you know, GPUs G and GPU RDMA, uh, things like that uh, uh, with Dask via UCX. So just interesting. So now I'm going to talk about containers, so why we use containers. Um, you know, so we talked about our networking and a few libraries, and, you know, it's, it's kind of comp complex because you could have a lot of different uh, network types and you could have uh, 
you know, you have these different uh, library components, frameworks, and you want to put it all together. So anyone who's ever had to put these uh, uh, items together, you know, you might have used modules or you have some kind of paths or scripts and you say, okay, you grab this guy from here and, and put it all together. And maybe like we mentioned, RPM, somehow, somehow you need to put it all together. So containers are very popular in, the, in that regard because uh, you can kind of put your uh, software stack just uh, in one kind of file or, you know, if you keep it on a Docker registry somewhere, uh, you, you, you can kind of containerize and freeze it at a moment and say, okay, this is my contain and this is my software stack and you can work with that and you don't have to manage or remember 20 different uh, library components. So as an example, here's a uh, kind of le uh, high level example here, you know, you got, you want to run this NAMD and VMD what, and they have all these interdependent uh, components. So somebody has to install this, somebody has to maintain this, update this, things could be incompatible, like this guy works with 9.0 but not 9.2. You know, it has, so you, instead of having this mass, and you might be familiar with that, you know, using modules, you can just use, you containerize it and now you just have these containers in a registry or you can even just have containers as files and you just load up the container and it has the software stack that uh, you want. Uh, so yes, so this is the motivation. Just you have complex software stacks that just work. Uh, and uh, I mean, there are, there are, the workflow is different with containers, but really there's no uh, downsides to it. Uh, I mean, there are always advantages and disadvantages, but in general, your performance doesn't change uh, and it simplifies your uh, uh, deployment. Just as an example of how you would work, you know, if you had bare metal, let's say you had a bare metal, in this case, they're showing a PBS uh, uh, job script, you'd have to load up all these uh, environments, make sure they're all compatible with each other, and then you'd be able to run your application versus with a container, I mean, you still need a job script, uh, but you could use just a singularity container, let's say, and you don't need to worry about what is compatible with what, and if you lost that script that put your modules together just in the right way for it to work, then you're like, you're gonna spend a couple days probably trying to figure it out <laughs> why it doesn't work anymore. <laughs> and especially if you have like a non-module part component, maybe glib or something, something that you don't have to load, but that you assume is just part of your OS or kernel, and it's all of a sudden you updated your kernel, things don't work, you know. Uh, so things like that can be a pain. You, with a container, you have a more reliable uh, environment to replicate your work. So with regards to containers, so there is a bit of a complication. So we have something called uh, NVIDIA, con uh, NVIDIA Container Runtime or NVIDIA container, LibNVIDIA container. This uh, library uh, enables uh, GPU pass-through to containers, because uh, when initially containers came out, um, they, you know, it wasn't a simple thing to just pass in a, a hardware device into it, so you, know, you print from your, I don't know if you can print from a container or not, but let's say you want to talk to your GPUs, that wasn't supported before. So, uh, we had something called NVIDIA Docker, now we have something called NVIDIA Docker 2, but NVIDIA Docker 2 basically builds, is just a wrapper on this guy, uh, LibNVIDIA container, and through this hook uh, that any container you know, technology can use, they can now map our GPUs into, into their container system. So you have some, you know, Singularity, Docker being some of the most popular ones. CRIO is popular with the uh, Kubernetes, LXC. I'm, I'm not familiar with Kata, but I think that's also popular. Um, so, so I'm, I'm here I'm gonna explain a, a little bit with Docker and Singularity. I've been mentioning these two. So Docker initially is a, is a very popular container technology, uh, but everything is, uh, it's microservices oriented, really was kind of meant for 
web services or uh, I mean really not necessarily web services but my, what you call microservices architectures and, so and, uh, uh, and, f and software uh, where you break up your application into these modules and all of them talk to each other. So uh, in HPC when you're just doing compute that can actually become a huge headache because uh, I mean you don't need to break up your uh, compute, you just have a, you know, some kind of simulation or uh, computation job. You don't, you don't need to break it into a user database and front and front end this. Uh, you just have a, it's mostly uh, back end oriented. So Singularity uh, says, okay, well, we like this containerization idea because obviously it's nice. You can put your, uh, simplify your software stack, but we want to be able to run it and have it compatible with uh, uh, HPC environments, so uh, I forgot the guy's name, Kurtz something. Uh, he wrote Singularity, uh, which uh, just, it's kind of, it's a container but with less isolation and he made it compatible with all the popular, uh, that I mentioned in the slides before, all the popular uh, schedulers, like PBS, Lerm, uh, whatever you use. I think I believe they support a lot of them. Craig Kurtzer is also get the guy that started the CentOS project, just to interrupt you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, yeah, he's a popular guy. <laughs> Let's see what I have here. So just, uh, this is, again, high-level uh, diagram showing you today, if you install uh, NVIDIA, lib NVIDIA container, you would run your Docker with uh, this flag runtime equals NVIDIA, and so we have a run C uh, hook. Uh, that will uh, enable GPUs in your Docker containers. So just an interesting thing to note, uh, I believe the future this upcoming releases of Docker will have, you won't even need to do that anymore. Uh, I believe Docker w w adopted this uh, uh, plugin, so it's just gonna be installed with your Docker install. So you'll be able to just run Docker and have this flag GPUs all. You don't have to, right now, if you had to install NVIDIA container, you'd have to pull it from GitHub and install those modules. Um, but it will be just part of Docker, just make your life easier. So one other interesting kind of, we have this already working in beta. Uh, you might have seen, and if you notice, paid attention to the block diagrams before you, you saw that. Uh, I don't know if I, let's see how I show this. So just to point this out, sorry, going back a bunch of slides. All right, so you see you got the container runtime here, but you got the drivers in here. So you, right now when you run these containers and NVIDIA GPUs, the driver is still kind of installed separately and then you we have this split with uh, as long as your driver supports the CUDA runtime that you install within the uh, uh, container, but you don't install the CUDA driver, then you're fine. But if your driver doesn't support the CUDA runtime, then you'd have to update the driver on your system. So we have something in the works uh, where you can uh, have containers with CUDA drivers installed in them. So it's just, again, simplifying your software stack so you don't, you don't have to you know, often you, you, something is working, then you pull the latest CUDA and you try to run it on your system and it doesn't work. And you and goes, oh, it doesn't work because this driver is outdated. So then you go back to your admin and say, update my drivers again. So this will be just one last thing for your uh, sysadmin, uh, your data center administrator to install and maintain on this system. You'll, you could ha you'll ha be able to uh, install uh, drivers. Now before in the past people were doing this, but because Containers weren't really, you weren't supposed to do that. It really broke your compatibility when you install the driver within a container. Uh, so, but we are enabling it now to be able to do this. Before, if you did this and you installed your driver into a container, all you were doing is just your driver on the host had to match your driver in the container exactly. And if it didn't, it wouldn't work. So you really, def there, there was no benefit to that. You were better off just decoupling your driver in runtime. Uh, but in, in the future, hopefully, or this is already, we already have this. If you want to do this, you can do this today, but it's in uh, beta. 
this. Oops. All right, next slide. So just a few other interesting uh, things coming up in 2019 that we're going to support. You know, I mentioned driver containers, CoreOS, for those of you who might be familiar with multi-process service in uh, containers. I'm not going to delve into this too much, just kind of informational slide. All right, now, uh, scaling GPUs, and primarily I'm going to focus on MPI. So, so just a general idea with MPI, how MPI spawns your jobs. You know, you have a, you, you launch your MPI on uh, your head node or your compute, your initial first compute node, and then from that, kind of, you know, it might not be SSH, but typically it's SSH. It, it'll spawn your other processes on the other nodes, and then they all kind of talk to each other. Let's see, did I? Yeah, I took this graph. If you want to really understand this process, this paper is pretty good. You could read it. Uh, it's pretty short, but uh, this goes into it a little bit more detail, so you can kind of see how you have this OOB out-of-band links. So through that, you just uh, you just uh, launch your MPI process, but then once MPI is loaded, then uh, on the back end, it's all direct high-speed link. You know, it could be InfiniBand or whatever you're using. Uh, so it's, it's, if you want to kind of understand that process better, you can refer to this paper. Uh, so with the MPI and containers, there's kind of two approaches uh, to it. Um, kind of, I don't know. We... I, I, I borrowed some of these slides. Uh, we term it outside in and inside out. I don't know if that's the best term for it, but outside in is basically your MPI run is, in, uh, is outside. You're going to do MPI run and then your command. Your command is actually going to involve calling your container, and the container is calling the MPI program within your, uh, uh, you know, within the container or however you want to set up. The, your container is basically setting up that uh, environment. Inside out is where you launch your MPI within the container, so it's um, it's a bit more independent of your system. You know, with outside in, you'd actually have to set up part of your software components on the cluster. It's not all containerized in that, which which is not necessarily the best thing because now your software stack gets complex again. Uh, inside out, you can you, you can also set it up, but then you have to kind of bootstrap your uh, communications. Uh, channels between containers. So I have uh, a couple here charts showing you the differences. So you know, typic, you know, in uh, in a nice containerized environment, you just want you got your host OS, but then everything else is containerized. Outside in, you you would have your MPI runtime, SSH server, and host OS outside, and then you got your MPI library part inside your container, you know, maybe your application is in here, or however you have it mounted in there. Um, but th the benefits of outside in, uh, again, we're, we're on that first slide, is uh, uh, for those uh, HPC centers, you know, where you have your uh, uh, traditional schedulers, uh, resource managers, they work, they're uh, integrate very nicely with this outside in approach. So you could have a, you know, you, you have a little bit of both. Uh, outside in schematics. So this is kind of another, just another view of this for you to understand better. So you, you uh, MPI run, you run MPI and then your command on node one. And then the communication hap, uh, is managed by this initial MPI run that is outside the container. Versus inside the container, you would your MPI run is invoked in your containerized script, and then somehow you know you're relying that these SSH they're able to talk to each other. Just uh, I guess w another way of looking at it. Uh, so th this inside out. Uh, method actually works pretty well with if you have a container-oriented scheduler, something like Cube, uh, Kubeflow. I don't have a lot of slides on that. There's really not enough time to cover it. But with Kubeflow, it orchestrates something more or less like this. 
is a, or Kubernetes in, with Kubeflow. It has a, some called an MPI job operator, and basically it's doing this uh, kind of orchestration for you. All right, now we have a little bit of time. I'm gonna go into a few demos. So the demos I have are using Horovo. They're pretty simple, because they, here, my goal is just to kind of show you that outside in, inside out approach uh, and how it looks like in practice. Uh, I'm gonna be using Horovod, uh, the framework for this. So Horovod is very nice, like just architecturally, it, it puts things together kind of in exactly the, you know, the right way, in an optimal way, leveraging all the technologies that are available, you know, it's dynamic, so if you don't have them, it'll, it'll fall back to whatever it is you have. Um, and you can kind of see, so Horovod is uh, for distributed, for deep learning frameworks that uh, it helps you distribute those frameworks. It now latest version supports TensorFlow, PyTorch, MXNet. So it, it, um, it's a nice framework to uh, standardize on. It was, uh, we, we worked uh, with Uber, well Uber developed it, I, think, I believe we helped them a little bit or debugged our stuff to make sure it works for them. Uh, so I'm gonna run an example with singul singularity, starting with singularity. So in a singularity you would have a, you know, your outside in approach, you would have your uh, allocation, right? And then you load your module, so you have MPI, and then you gotta load singularity, so you have singularity, and then you, you can run your, uh, your script. The, the, the actual script is this tensorflow underscore eminist Python code, so. So I'm, I'm gonna run this. And you guys, yeah, if you guys have questions, let me know. So I already did that S alloc part. Like, um, you know, I'm, I'm on a Slurm cluster. So just to kind of show you, you know, I do S info. I don't know if for those of you who are familiar with Slurm, and I have a bunch of nodes, and then any node that I want, if it's idle, I can make a reservation on it, and and I'll get it right away, otherwise I'll be queued. I could just submit a, a job. I don't have to be on it interactively, it will run as the node becomes available. That's the idea. Um, I go back to where I was. <laughs> I have to find it. All right, what? Okay, I was here, <laughs> all right. All right, I already have a reservation here. This is, I'm on uh, these DGX nodes. I have two of them, because we're gonna run multi-node jobs. And so, if I wanna run interactively, you know, I have module list, and I wanna do this uh, outside-in approach, I have to have ability to run an MPI run. So right now I can't run MPI, I do MPI run, and it says command not found. So in a traditional HPC cluster, on a bare metal, you would have some called modules. So I actually need to load a bunch, a couple of these. All right. All right, so now with this, I have, can you guys see this? Or is this too small, I can zoom in more. All right, now I have an MPI run command, so I can actually invoke this. Uh, I also have singularity, which I loaded through this other module. So if I do module list, we have these modules that are here. Before it was no modules, now we got our uh, various uh, modules. And so these are all kind of important to enable you to do that. Our DMA stuff like this hardware locality library works together with MPI, et cetera. Uh, next thing, I need to, I'm gonna run this interactively. At this part, I'm just doing interactive, but at this point I could launch the job. But to do it interactively, I need to get on a compute node. So I'm on a compute node right here. In this case, this is a DGX1. It has eight GPUs, V100s. And, uh, and now I can run this command. I'm just gonna copy paste it. So we can kinda, before I launch it, look into it. 
So this nickel socket I have name is just saying, uh, basically with nickel and horrible, you have to exclude these non-routed interfaces. These virtual interfaces don't, don't actually have like a, uh, uh, routing through a switch. So you, you, this is the trick and you have to use these MCA options. But other than that, you, uh, the main point is you got MPI run. I'm gonna have how many tasks I have. It's one task per GPU for this script. Uh, data parallelism, and this is uh, specifying singularity, execute, minus minus NV, that's the flag that they use for uh, uh, enabling GPUs in the container. This is a container, it's just a file. Uh, it could be a registry too, singularity also has uh, registries now, so you could pull it directly from a registry. Uh, and then I have some kind of code here that you know, we can look into, but it's, it's just a horrible TensorFlow code. And so now that I run this, you know, here I have, it's kind of hard to see. So here I'm, I SSH'd in parallel to these nodes and I'm gonna uh, watch, you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm just showing you the mechanics here. As a simple example, I'm mean, this as a toy example. It's, I'm not doing anything serious here, but showing you that uh, I'm distributing the job on across 16 GPUs, so eight GPUs per node. And it's dynamic, you know, if you had four GPUs per node, it would be fine. I could use however many nodes you want. Um, all right, I guess it ran already. <laughs> uh, oh, whoops. Uh, yeah, right. I had I ran this before and it, uh, it didn't have to clear. Sorry. All right. Just let me clear the checkpoints because that code is, it will restart from your checkpoint, so it didn't it barely ran. But uh, yeah, it's gonna run the code and rerun the learning of your MNIST jobs. So it's doing the initialization. Any questions on this so far? <laughs> this we can do now like an interactive question session. If you guys have questions here, I can answer them. Um, 10 minutes, all right. Yeah, so now it's, it's running. You can see here, it's kind of hard to see, but the, ten, the job is, you know, so your user would basically run this job and they be hopefully also have a monitoring uh, UI or somehow be able to see uh, utilization of the GPUs. Uh, the inside out approach is a little bit, uh, it's a bit different. I have a wrapper script for it. So if you guys wanna refer to that, uh, you know, t take a look at this site here. I wrote a few examples there uh, with inside out examples. So inside out, you know, I just need singularity. I don't need any of the open MPI stuff set up outside of my environment. Everything is within the, uh, within the container. So in that approach, I would do something like this. So I'm, uh, let me just clear that checkpoints. All right, get off the compute node. Module purge. I'm gonna purge my modules, I don't need any of them. You know, and again, this makes the life of your admin easier. He doesn't have to install 50 modules. I do need Singularity though, so I'm gonna load Singularity. Uh, so, so now I can do, you know, Singular. I just need this application. Um, and so now I could run, with this wrapper, basically I'm doing uh, a bootstrap where my S uh, SSH servers are uh, launched on each uh, node and then they can talk to each other and MPI can be invoked within the, uh, within the container. Uh, performance will be the same. So, 
It's actually interesting. You could do outside in with Docker. Naturally, Docker actually works better with inside out technique, but you could put together and uh, you basically need to make Docker look like Singularity. You need to eliminate all that isolation that it has by default. And that's just, you have to do a, a few flags like run it as a user and pass your host uh, for networking. Uh, and then you have to load in your device, your, uh, uh, your uh, network interface. So you could run, run outside in with Docker as well but typically do inside out, which again, naturally can be orchestrated with Kubernetes, or you can have like a wrapper script around it. Like I have this example, and I have it specifically for Slurm, but it would be pretty easy to modify it for any other uh, type of a uh, uh, scheduler. All right, and just, uh, let's see, just go back to this guy. Did he run? All right, I, I believe he ran. I was just foreign looking, but yeah, you can see it ran. Uh, so a few, just a few helper scripts if you guys are interested to look into it some more. Uh, you can look at this multi-node containers, GitHub page. Uh, another interesting uh, utility we have to put together, so you know, complexity, you don't have to set up modules, but now you have to write these Docker files, and those can also sometimes be a pain to write because you know if you, you put together your software stack but you still have to kind of research each component. You know, this version of TensorFlow works with this version of CUDA, works with this version of Nickel. So we have uh, something called HPC Container Maker. Refer to this GitHub, you can install it directly from pip. Uh, uh, Python package index, uh, package manager. So, uh, yeah, and with this, you can write these recipes and put, and uh, we have a bunch of modules in there. So you can put together your uh, uh, script recipes and generate uh, these Docker files or singularity dev files, wh whichever one you want. And there, this is a pretty nice utility and it supports multi-stage uh, Docker files. So it can create, um, uh, uh, efficient kind of small size do uh, Docker containers for you. This is just a few slides showing you how to run it. You would run it something like this with format either Docker or if you want Singularity, say format Singularity, then you build it. If you do multi uh, Singularity doesn't support multi-stage, so if you want to do multi-stage uh, containers, then you'd have to do it with Docker and then my suggestion is, you know, make the container in Docker, and then it's pretty easy to convert Docker containers to Singularity. There's a Docker to Singularity utility. Yep. No, I, I have not used. No, I, I haven't used Summit. For <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, I'm assuming yeah, because yeah, if you set it up right, it should be pretty fast. <laughs> Probably, yeah, set the world. They're constantly setting new records. I, I forgot, I think Sony just set a new record chaining in one minute or something. Uh, all right, that's, that's all I had. All right, good.